Ladies and gentlemen, join MythVision's Patreon, not only to support us, but there are 72 videos that I did with Dr. Dennis R. McDonald and Richard Carrier, all on the Patreon, early access. You guys can ask personal questions when I go to interview these scholars, and you're helping MythVision grow. So, <laughs> thank you for the introduction, and uh, I will try my best to answer you know, questions you have to the best of my ability, as I said. So uh, you want me to tell you if the Quran is a miracle or not? This is the, the, que the first question. Yes, and I know sometimes it's going to be your opinion on certain things. Sure. I want to try and take a scientific method, a historical approach, and be critical of what we actually find in the data. How one interprets that is up to them, but it seems to me when someone claims this book was literally a miracle, it's perfect as it is, they kind of downplay variant readings. They don't really see how that might play a significant role. I look at biblical studies and I could see, okay, we don't have the original. We, we definitely don't have that. Uh, there's so many different variants and manuscripts, sure. et cetera, in the tradition. Is Islam or is Muslim faith in the Quran sharing the same kind of motif in a way? Right. Okay. So there are many questions to, uh, to answer here. So let us start with, you know, first the, the miracle issue. In, in When we are studying scripture, right, in, in an academic setting, I don't think we, I think most, at least most uh, academics, we are not really concerned with trying to research such questions, you know, is the Quran a miracle or not? You know, at the end of the day, it's a subjective opinion you know, for people to find, you know, this book or, you know, the Quran uh, as a miracle. Uh, other people don't think it's a miracle. It's as, you know, it's as simple as that. So there are many academics who are not Muslims who approach uh, studying the Quran uh, as a great book, okay, for Islamic civilization. And they study it, even though that they are not Muslims, they have great respect for the book. There are other academics, you know, who don't hold the Quran to such standards. And they think that, you know, it is written by, you know, a person in the seventh century. Uh, it's full of mistakes, contradictions. And they also base their research uh, starting from that, uh, if you want, you know, viewpoint. There are also Muslims, you know, who research the, the text starting from the perspective that it is a miracle. There are other Muslims who are allegedly objective and they also try to approach the text as just a literary text how it was transmitted, what it says, regardless whether it's a miracle or not. Um, so I don't think in academia we are concerned with proving or disproving that the Quran is a miracle. Okay, that's not, uh, you know, I don't recall reading an academic article that tries to prove that right. or disprove right. it, right? So what it means to, you know, for, for at least for Muslims that the Quran is a miracle, that, you know, they think that, that the Quran holds First, you know, the, there are several, if you want, several la layers of that. First, that language, okay? So um, it's written in a literary language that is very eloquent. It was revealed to the prophet. He challenged, you know, the Arabs back then to compose something similar, you know, in, uh, in eloquence. Uh, according to the tradition, they failed, they couldn't. Thus... You know, the Islamic tradition says that this is why the Quran is a miracle, because no one was able to imitate its style. OK, now, whether this is true or not, that's open to discussion. You know, we do have many attempts for people back in the days and even recently that they try to emulate the style of the Quran. Now, whether they are successful or not, that's a subjective issue. Right. So you can read something and then you would like it. You would say, oh, well, I like this piece of literature. I think this is better than you know, this chapter or that chapter of the Quran as a reader, right? As a reader. Uh, but of course, if you are, you know, holding this text as the uh, perfect example of eloquence, you are going to downplay any attempt, right? To emulate right. it. So at the end of the day, it's very difficult to be subjective uh, in, in matters of literary taste to say that, oh, this text is more eloquent than this because I feel it. <laughs> so right? that, would, that begs the question to say, from a scholarly point of view, uh, sure. I asked to put the scholarly sure. glasses on because that's what you are. Uh -huh. um, how did the Quran come to us? 
based on the evidence we have and not just what the tradition wants to necessarily say, um, how did the Quran come to us? Because from what I understand, there are multiple, even within the tradition, this is the mm -hmm. problem. This is the problem I see. Even within the tradition, you have Abu Bakr and then you have other traditions within the Islamic faith that are saying, no, this is what happened. He went around and he collected the memory of the, the recitation of the Quran from warriors that were dying and they didn't mm -hmm. want them all to die off. So we're collecting all this. And then there's another tradition and I'm probably missing some things because I'm sure, not. Sure. I, will, I, will, I will reiterate. Yeah. yeah sure. And then this other guy and he's trying to do this and that. And like they're all trying to explain how we got the Quran mm -hmm. in tradition. And I want to try and give tradition its opportunity. But I also want to look at it empirically from the scholarly point of view on what scholars have concluded saying, this is how we actually think we, we come to the conclusion. And maybe we'll never know exactly how, but that's okay. okay. I like to, to investigate. Sure. Okay, so first point, let's talk about memory and memorization. Um, I think one of the problems, especially Western scholars, when they study Islam, okay, regardless of their background, okay, um, there are certain cultural elements that they are not aware of, okay? And then they learn it, you know, they study Arabic, they study Islam, and then, you know, they learn it. Okay, well, memorizing text is, you know, important in their tradition, but to what extent, okay? If you grow up in, you know, a Middle Eastern slash Eastern, not just Middle Eastern, I mean, there are even Eastern cultures, you know, the Chinese, the Japanese, they also cherish memorization, okay? The certain element of memorization, at least in the Western environment, it's not as important, okay, or as evident as it is in the, in the Middle East. So when, you know, you hear, you know, a story about, uh, you know, people memorizing, you know, the text of the Quran or memorizing, you know, hadith, we can talk about this later, or poetry. It's like, oh, how is it possible that, you know, all people can memorize all this amount of information accurately? So that's now the, the issue here, accurately. So our problem or our issue here is the accurate part. It's not the memorization part. So to what, so we already know that the this tradition or this culture um, their individuals, they do memorize texts, okay? A uh, lot of texts. We are talking about thousands of poems. We are talking about, you know, 6,000, 200, 300 verses of the Quran. And it is evident today you have, you know, young children who can, by the age of five or six, they can memorize the whole text of the Quran. And we're not talking about one or two individual. It's just a normal practice, right? In this kind of culture. Um, they so said that was a miracle too, by the way. <laughs> it, it, well, <laughs> no, it's not, so. well, again, it is subjective, but you can teach the kid anything, yes. right? So you can teach them the Quran, you can teach them the Bible to 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 memorize it. They can you can teach them music. Yeah. You know, there are children who are five or six years old who memorize scores of uh, of symphonies and, and exactly. sonatas, right? Uh, so you can teach a kid anything. So the miracle is if you have a I don't know a sixty year old or 70 year old who mem who memorize who tries to memorize a text will he or she be able to memorize the text as perfectly or as good as a 5 year old kid so that's the right. the issue. so the point here is that uh, you know it is a culture that relies on memorization of texts more than writing so we'll get now to writing when we tackle this the issue of memorization in you know in research we don't question the fact that Arabs or Muslims do memorize the texts. We question the accuracy, like to what extent? Is it really, you know, that the 70 people who were killed at the battle that you were mentioning, right, Abu Bakr, when he wanted to collect the Quran? Why the first account of the collection? So why did he, people, according to the tradition, Muslims or the companions of the Prophet, they, you know, they memorized the, the Quran, okay, most of it. And uh, then there was the apostasy uh, uh, wars, okay, during Abu Bakr's time. When after, after Muhammad died, you know, there are tribes in the south, you know, who reverted, okay? So he went and he fought them in the south. According to the account, 70 of these people, of these memorizers of the Quran, they died. And then the account says, well, because they were afraid that those people who memorized the Quran, 
uh, are dying and then the Quran would be lost. So he, uh, you know, suggested let us collect it so that it's not going to be lost. Okay. Uh, now, there are many, there are issues with this, you know, with this uh, tradition. Um, one of the questions that, you know, researchers ask is that what do we know about these 70 people who died in the battle? We don't have their names, okay? And other researchers have suggested that, you know, probably those 70 um, uh, readers, why would you send 70 reciters of the Quran to fight in a battle? Okay? Good question. Uh, questions asked. It's a motif, you know? too, if I might add. Sometimes sure. I might throw some things in here. To yeah, yeah, please, please do, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the academic arena, if you will, recognizes, for example, there is this narrative a supposed historical narrative of how right. the septuagint came to be there mm -hmm. were 70 scribes who supposedly went and translated the hebrew into greek now mm -hmm. many of these scholars will say we know that a translation took place mm -hmm. but 70 you know it's a significant number it kind of carries some religious and spiritual probably numerological significance and so sure. to buy yeah. into the tradition that this is actually historically accurate you know, what if it's trying to say something different is the point? Or no, I agree with you. It's, again, it's the number seven. We have, you know, the uh, the tradition of the seven ahruf or the seven modes. It's also seven, you know, seven skies, seven earths. I mean, there's something about number seven in the Near East, at least. So it's not just, you know, to... Uh, so, I mean, whether they were 70 or, you know, 68 or 60, I don't know. But the, the question is, uh, we don't have a full list of the names of these people. OK, and the question is, we also have other accounts in, you know, in, in other traditions that the prophet would send readers, the word, you know, Qurra, you know, to fight. And one, you know, a question that was raised by, you know, a couple of scholars is that uh, why would you send Quran reciters, you know, to fight? And other, you know, these two scholars, they suggested that, you know, Yumbol back in the uh, I think 20, 25 years in an article. And recently, Behnam Sadiqi also, he gave a lecture on this, and probably his article came out recently, is that the word or reader, it, it had double meaning back then. Okay, so it means, you know, um, a hermit slash, you know, people who came from a specific region in, in Iraq, and they were called Qurra, and there was a mix between the, uh, you know, the two the two terms. That's uh, an interpretation, at least, you know, right. uh, trying to get away from uh, the narrative that you have 70 Quran reciters who died in a battle for, and we don't know anything about them, right? Got it. Um, so, so back to the question of, this is the first collection. So they were afraid that the Quran would be lost. And, you know, Abu Bakr, he suggested to collect the Quran so that it will not be lost. And then what happened is that they assigned, you know, one of the younger companions, his name is Zaid. And then they told him, well, you know, you are young, you're energetic, you know, why don't you start collecting the Quran? And then he said, how could I do something that the Prophet didn't do? Okay, hmm. so that's another, you know, question. So how, why the narrative says is that why, how could we do something that the Prophet didn't do? Meaning that if the Prophet didn't collect the Quran, why should we collect it? This is a very interesting point that you make. It, right. It just, I don't know why it reflect. I always reflect back to my biblical studies to make an mm -hmm. analogy for anyone sure. watching this. Yeah. Um, you know, we have what we see is the canon now. But during like the first century, for example, various versions of Judaism had various, if you could use the term canons, they didn't mm -hmm. actually go by a standard, this is what we use. They had Enoch. They had all sorts of different, some of the stuff you'd go, that's not in our Bible. We don't allow mm -hmm. that in our Bible. Uh -huh. They did. So um, they used whatever text. And so eventually a standardization, canonization right. eventually develops in all of these systems. Sure including Judaism, Christianity, and I suspect based on your books, also Islam. And this is wonderful though. This points out that earlier, there's no reason even in the tradition to mm -hmm. make the assumption that Muhammad had the whole Quran collected. Now, one might argue in some way, well, he had it in memory and he shared it by word of mouth orally to other people. But that, that comes to the question, did he really 
uh, receive, or is this tradition developed over time by Muslim early scholars who are mm -hmm. developing this movement, mm -hmm. creating a collection, and then canonizing what they call the Quran? You know, I mean, again, a valid question, and you know, we don't we don't have a you know a, a clear answer, right? So we we don't we don't have sources directly that go directly back to this period, right? So most of our sources, they come 150 years later, you know, reports on that period. We don't have direct, direct. Um, we do have eyewitnesses. We can talk about this also a little bit. So we, we, we do trust many of these accounts of what was happening. And why do we trust this? Because we have so many conflicting reports. Mm -hmm. So if you have one beautiful standard you know, report about something that happened, you always have doubts. But when you have many conflicting reports, okay, you have a general, if you want, a general story or a general account, but then the details, people differ on the details. That's a healthy sign. That's not a bad sign. It tells you that generally there is something that people are agreeing on, but they are they differ on the details. Right. You see, so it's the same with the, the Quran. We can talk about the variant readings later on. So my, at least my my position is, it's a healthy sign that the Quran has variants. It's not a bad thing. If it doesn't, I would be very skeptical about how far the text goes. If it has variants, it tells me that the the text is old. Right. And that's you know a, a rule of thumb. You know for for any text that is transmitted orally. Same with poetry. If you have poetry which has variants and it's transmitted by different people with variations, it tells you that the poetry is old. If you have one standard version of a poem, it means that it's not old and it's, it's written. canonized, right? It's standardized or canonized, right? Yeah. So same thing with historical narratives. So you have a general narrative with many with with, with discrepancies. That's a great sign. We want discrepancies. We don't want one beautiful standard, you know, narration of what happened, you know, back then. And that's, you know, the reason why we have, you know, these three, four, five different accounts of how the Quran was collected. They all share, if you want, a backbone, okay, of, of truth in a sense, of probably, you know, something true about what happened, but they differ in the details. And then we start asking these, you know, questions. So what does it mean that you know, people, you know, the, this companion, Zaid, he was saying, well, I'm, how, how dare we do something that the Prophet didn't do? And then it raises the question about the Quran. What is it? Is it, uh, should it be just an oral text? Should it be just, you know, um, uh, you know, selections of, uh, of recitations? You know, shouldn't, uh, should it be really a standardized, you know, canonized book? And, uh, you know, these questions people ask them, okay, why didn't, uh, I mean, you know, the prophet didn't die suddenly, okay, you know, he lived, he was 63, 64 years old, according to tradition, he predicted his death, or he knew he was dying, uh, he could have, you know, said, okay, I'm going to collect the Quran and make it, and make a, 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 a final version of it before, before I die, why didn't he do that, if it's important to have it written down. Right. And let me ask you so, this, in light of this, this is wonderful. Um, that makes perfect sense. He obviously wasn't concerned about this. If this concern starts to develop, yeah. I think, yeah. and, and I'm and this is me just my common sense based on other examples in history that I've looked mm -hmm. at. When you have Abu Bakr come on the scene, you have his three sons, Muhammad's three sons are too young. Mm -hmm. They're not able, so you know they marry Abu Bakr's uh, daughters. I think it is, and like, like there seems to be a political struggle for power, mm -hmm. as well as who's going to be the guy, the head honcho. We need to get the narrative under control. Right. Uh, I'm thinking in human terms on how right, we right. would naturally come to explain this. So here you have someone who goes, "We need to have full control of the narrative. We mm -hmm. need to have something standardized." And I wonder if they learned this. Maybe this is just something in the air for common sense for people, or they saw how the Jews and Christians that were living in the region, mm -hmm. that wasn't something, you know, I've heard people try to say they weren't living it. Yes, they were no. Jews. No, you, you, you have a, you have a good uh, common sense as well, because I mean, in the same, in the same narrative, I mean, speaking of that in this same account or in, in a, in an offshoot account after, you know, they made the first collection, 
Okay, so Zaid, he went around and then he started asking, you know, other companions, okay, tell me what you memorized. And then he started writing them, them down. At the end, according to one narrative, so Abu Bakr, you know, they put the, the uh, you know, the collection in front of, of him. And then he said, what should we call it? <laughs> wow. Right? So what should we call I mean, see, it's, it's uh, again, it doesn't matter whether this account is made up or not. It right. tells you something about even the, the person who fabricated the account or who, who transmitted it. It tells you about how people were thinking back then. Or mm -hmm. So he says, what should we call it? You know, again, see, this is the, uh, the distinction between something written and something recited. And then one asked, one answered, he said, why don't we call it, uh, what did, did he say, the Torah? Or I forgot which, you know, which term he gave. It's like, let's call it the Torah or let's call it like, you know, the, the scripture or Angel. And then he said, no, this is what the Jews call their scripture. Right, right. We don't want to call it the same. So, but back to your point about knowing what was happening. Of course, they knew what was happening. You know, Arabia was not just an isolated, you know, uh, place where they had no contact with what's happening around them. And then someone suggested that, okay, so why, why don't we call it Mus'haf Codex? This is what they call it in Ethiopia, the Mus'haf, oh, wow. right? And they said, okay, so that's a good, that's a good, so let's call it a Mus'haf. They didn't even call it Quran. They call it Mus'haf. It's just a codex. And that's from back then, not necessarily, again, the account, whether it's early or whether it's, you know, uh, made up 100, 150 years right. later, it tells you that from very, very early on, there was a distinction between the written text and the orally performed text. There are two distinct entities that people should realize that they are different, at least from a theological perspective. Now, you as a practical person say, well, what's the difference? You know, they, well, what, what we have written is the same as, as what, what you are reciting. Okay, from a practical purposes, it's the same. But from a theological perspective, the, the codex, you know, the reality of the codex is very different from the reality of the recited text. Okay? Okay. So, um, so the, so one of the, for example, back to the issues or, you know, discrepancies. So this account, um, you know, has issues, has certain discrepancies with some other accounts. So we have other accounts that said, uh, several of them, not just, you know, one or two, that the prophet had scribes, okay? And whenever he received revelations, he would ask the scribes to write them down to write these revelations down. And there are many of these accounts. So there are even the list, there is a list of the name of the people who were able to read and write, you know, these revelations. And there are also other accounts that he would instruct, you know, people to put this verse in front of that verse. When he received the revelations later on, no, put it in this chapter or that chapter. Again, whether these accounts are, are true or not, that's not the issue here. But then the question is if, we already have so many accounts about the prophet making certain kind of arrangements or a certain, if you want, personal collections. So what was the purpose of this first collection? Mm -hmm. Why did, you know, the, the head of the committee go when, you know, why did he go around and started asking other companions about verses that they memorized or looking for things written on, uh, leaves of trees and camel shoulders and stone, flat stones. Yep. This is the, the, the narrative, right? Uh, if, you know, the prophet already had scribes and he had already instructed them to write certain chapters down, okay? And again, there are, you know, many interpretations of this. Any contradiction, you can solve it. It's not an issue to solve contradictions in tradition. You, I'm, I'm sure you know that also. Oh, yeah. In, yeah, there's in always reconciling. You can always reconcile any two contradictory accounts. That's not the issue. But again, we ask questions. So what's the what's the purpose of, you know, of these accounts about early collections and this first collection, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, a second point is that this image that this account gives about, you know, the condition of the writing culture in Arabia. It gives you a very, you know, primordial, if you want, you know, Jurassic image of how people were reading and writing as if they only had flat stones and camel shoulders and leaves of trees to write on and we already know that 
you know, they were in touch with other cultures and they could have, they could afford, yes, paper was expensive and, you know, uh, but, uh, you know, the, the image this uh, that the, the account gives you, uh, it tells you that this is the first book. And so this is interesting to ask because as a scholar that, that has read this, you understand it in its actual language in Arabic, correct? Mm -hmm. So this is a big red flag. I can't even approach some of my what? Muslim friends without them saying to me, you don't know the language, therefore you can't even, don't even comment. You don't know what anything, you're not allowed to pretty much in, in their head because you don't have the language and you do. And here's my question. This goes into my biblical studies, but I wanna make it relate. I have been told, and I could be mistaken, that the Quran actually is using other sources to develop uh, it's it's um, if I could use it, it's surahs in in the Quran we have good indications that they knew of for example they knew infancy narratives of Jesus they knew these <coughs> narratives and mm -hmm. they saw those narratives um, in high esteem versus Orthodox Christianity which they don't even like the Trinity it's obvious so yeah. they're like no that's pagan that's Trinity that's not monotheism we have one God but they also like this um, infancy narrative so my common sense tells me they're reading literature and somehow incorporating mm -hmm. Jewish and Christian ideas and probably not just Jewish and Christian ideas, potentially even some of the Arab, uh, you know, cultural religious yeah. significances. Sure. So sure. you have a hybrid of like three or maybe more. More. Yeah. Yeah. Going on in the development of what we see in the text. And is this true from your understanding that it's using sources from other literature? Uh, again, I mean, sure, you can use it if you are, if you, uh, if you don't believe in the tradition, you can say, you know, this person, and there are many, there are other scholars, you know, who, uh, who really think that, you know, Muhammad was going to a cave and, you know, he was copying down uh, material, right? From, uh, from and the, the Quran itself says that. Right. You know, the, even so you are, you know, there are people now who are saying, you know, these, oh, he, you know, he was plagiarizing. Uh, well, I'm not saying plagiarism because that's a, uh, I'm very careful. Yeah. What I mean by that is that it's an influence. So like um, sometimes people will utilize like in Genesis, we see sure. uh, about the Garden of Eden and we go into the Noah's flood. Mm -hmm. well, I've been studying this for a while and I see intertextuality where they're using Mesopotamian epic of Gilgamesh narratives and they're rewriting it in a way for their own narrative but they are using it as a as a uh, for their imagination to their own context and I wonder hmm. if the Quran is doing the same thing with earlier manuscripts I, I mean it, it it is doing okay so it's doing the same thing whether it's manuscript or not we can get get to this whether these this information was circulating among people or whether it was just information in manuscripts and people were reading them and recycling them, right? Yeah, so, yeah. and the the point I was making is that um, the 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 text itself, you know, this if you want accusation, it was directed at Muhammad. They're saying, okay, well, you are using it says in the Quran that all this that you are doing, all the stories that you are telling us, you are actually writing it down. You are taking it from other sources. So it's not a, so people back then were not, they were also atheists back then and non-believers. It's not just a, uh, you know, uh, it's not like people were always, oh, everyone believed in, in Muhammad. No, there were people who didn't believe in him. And they were saying that you are a false prophet. And, you know, the Quran is plagiarized from other sources. The Quran wow. itself says that. Right in the Quran, it says this. Yes, yes, sure. You know, uh, on multiple occasions, not only once. <laughs> and then the Quran responds, "No, it is not. It is a revelation from God." <laughs> right. So, so you so, have you have two 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 different <laughs> ideas here that I think are interesting because in the New Testament, uh -huh. there is a book, Second Peter, where it says. Um, the author is pretending to be Peter and it's, mm -hmm. it's a forgery. And he says, brethren, these are not cleverly devised myths as <laughs> some would suppose. Uh -huh. Now he's encouraging the brother, the brethren 
Right. But we scholars approach this and say, hold on. That means people are accusing this whole movement as mm-hmm. a myth that it's mm-hmm. it's been created and it's not really actually true yeah. as you want to suppose. Uh-huh. And I think that's interesting because for me, when you have accusations like that, those are those are good for us to see right out the gate. You already have people who are going, come on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, even back then. So don't, I mean, people shouldn't assume that it's only because of the, you know, uh, 20th century modern, you know, science or thought or atheism. Oh, now we have new insights into what was happening 1400 years ago. No, people 1400 years ago, they were also skeptical about, you know, supernatural, if you want, or metaphysical aspects. So, Does, I'm sorry to ask this. I don't want to lose track of where we're going. Sure, Does sure. Muhammad kill some of these skeptics uh, according to the text? I mean, you mean as a command, just like, oh, you said this and I'm going to issue a... Well, uh, no, I mean, uh, just in general, because I've heard and I want to try and represent Islam accurately from a scholar because there are a lot of people out there. I want to give benefit of the doubt mm-hmm. that will that will talk down, right? They just, oh, the prophet was a murderer. He was this, he was that. And it's like, hold on, guys. Like, I get it. That was in a time we don't live in. And things right. were not as pretty as they are today. But I've heard that people who opposed him, who like this, for example, said, no, this is not from God. You guys are plagiarizing. You're not a prophet of God. This is mm-hmm. not true, blah, blah, blah. Did he potentially take these people out as a political kind of power struggle? And he's saying they were they were fighting. Right. So it's not. They were not living in the, uh, you know, in a, in the United States where, you know, you can go and criticize someone and then, okay, fine, you criticize me, I criticize you. And then it's a different uh, setting, right? So it's a bad analogy then. And yeah. also those people who were accusing him, they were not just, you know, sitting and accusing him and not doing and taking forceful actions. They were both factions. They were fighting, right? So it's a, a fight for survival. So Thank you they were fighting him. That. I, right. I wanted to clarify that because there's a lot of people who want to use that as a tool to just bash Islam. And it's like, well, sure, you could go to other things to try and do that, but you don't have to go to this example and just act like he just murdered everyone that disagreed with him and he just wanted to do bad. I'm, I'm saying that. Now, if he's a prophet for all time, I have my problems with that. You know, like, uh, but, but yeah. No, no, I understand the point. And people are, I mean, in my opinion, that's, you know, that's not, again, a scholarly opinion, just just my own person. You don't, no one should quote me on this. It's that if people, you know, don't like, uh, you know, how this person set, you know, himself as an example, they shouldn't be liking that, right? Exactly. So it is what it is. And if, if they don't like the fact that, you know, this person, okay, he, he committed, you know, murder or he killed his opponents, I mean, it is what it is, right? right. So it happened, and uh, it happened in a sense that he was not just sitting and then issuing a fatwa, you know, say, oh, go kill, kill this person because he said, you know, these bad things about me. It was people were fighting back then. So, and if they did not fight back, you know, Islam as a movement wouldn't have, uh, we were talking about the apostasy wars, you know, you know, yeah. Muhammad died, and then there are many tribes who pretended to be Muslims because of, you know, I don't know, economical or uh, political uh, incentives, they only converted outwardly. They didn't really convert. Once Muhammad died, okay, they said he died. Now we can go back to our business. And then the first caliph, you know, they started the apostasy wars and then they went and uh, fought. So it was, you know, 1400 years ago, it was a different setting from yeah. uh, from now and people were fighting. Now, people are not comfortable with that. I think it's their own, uh, you know, choice. They like this or they don't like it. It's, it's not my uh, call to interpret or reinterpret. But from a historical perspective, I would say that people were fighting, you know, for survival. So right. uh, if someone is criticizing him. They were not just sitting and writing, you know, a column in, in, in the New Yorker, you know, criticizing him. They were also fighting them, fighting each other in a military uh, aspect. You could so. understand my concern and why I brought that up because sure, sure, there's sure. a lot of people who just want to bash Islam and there's a lot of people who want to protect 
And it's like, hold on, there's probably a gray area here and something in between. I want to get back to variants or potentially variants. Maybe we can get back into uh, origins of the Quran, things like that. I just find this very fascinating. There's, there's already all these traditions like you talk about. And these traditions, I must ask, like the Abu Bakr tradition, is this the earliest dated tradition we have? And, you know, like, I guess when these things come out matter. For example, a lot of Muslims I talk to, they don't like the way the Hadith look. In fact, of course, I'm a skeptic. I have a channel that like has a bunch of skeptical thinking. And the ones that show up once in a while when I do a live, they're like, oh, no, just the Quran onlyist. Mm-hmm. And they don't believe in the Hadith at all. And it's like, you just threw away like 90% of Islam, like throwing away the – and that's their choice. But my point is a lot of them will say Hadith are not historically reliable because they come so much later. They're, they're developed over time. Well, it makes me kind of wonder the Quran we have also, if you yeah. will, comes mm-hmm. later or at least is developed over time and it grows into what we have now. Um, can you tell us about dating and how that matters for the Quran and maybe the Hadith? I know that's a huge question. I don't know how you want to answer it. <laughs> uh, so you, you're talking about dating, um, dating the, tra- you're not talking about manuscripts, right? You're just dating in a sense of wh- to, to which period of time or to which date we can, trust these hadiths or these accounts coming from that early period and there's too many questions i asked there i guess the totally. question we'll start with the the quran let's start with the quran because that is the the holy book and right. what it is now is the canonized version how early can we really go with manuscript data knowing what we have is like popping on the scene and we go okay we know that this is around this time muhammad dies in what six 32, I'm 632. What are some of the earliest manuscripts we have of the Quran? Okay, so let me go back to a point I I made at the beginning about orality, okay? About orality and, you know, Western perspective about manuscripts. Again, I will will reiterate that. Uh, You only trust physical objects, a manuscript. If you don't have a manuscript, it's like, okay, well, I don't trust what's happening, you know, in the 6th century or the 7th century. And, you know, you are entitled, you know, to, of course, to do that. If you don't have a manuscript of the Quran from the 7th century, well, okay, why do I have to trust what a person told me 200 years later? Can, right? I, can I just put a caveat yes, yes, as please, why? Please. Yeah. Real mm-hmm. quick, I just want to say the reason why I'm that way is my previous research in other fields such as Judaism and Christianity. Right. We have seen the development of earlier manuscripts and and later manuscripts, we've seen them change what it meant Mm -hmm. earlier in later manuscripts. We've seen things change and it's not always the same. So if we- But over, but in in the case of the Bible, right? Old or New Testament. So how many hundreds of years you have from, let's say the beginning of an oral tradition to the writing down? Well, th- this is where the dispute, a lot of scholars will go, we're not right. sure if, I'm sure there were oral sayings of Jesus, let's say, floating around in the first century um, mm-hmm. after he dies, 30-something AD, let's just say. Um, yeah. we, Paul's letters come in 50s. Mm-hmm. Um, but we don't have any manuscripts of any of this stuff till l- late second century at best, um, the right. earliest P52 of John. And so w- we've seen like mythologization. We have like early church fathers saying Marcion had a different Luke. And I'm just mm-hmm. saying like, we have tradition telling us there's problems even in the early stuff. So we don't know right. what's behind yeah. these manuscripts. It's hard. No, to no. The reason I'm asking you because no, that's, that's good because I want you to make, you know, you and the, the people who are listening to make this kind of comparison. So, right. so even let's say the sayings of Jesus. Okay. So let's take the new Testament and not the old one. So in which, what, what were the circumstances you know, under like when he was saying something and people were, let's say, writing it down or recording it. So in which context he was saying this? Was he repeating it or he was saying this only once? For example? I would think if there was a guy, he's repeating this, obviously. Yeah. Um, there's no reason for him only to say this once. I think he's be teaching his teachings. Okay. Yeah. He has lessons. He's probably giving 
but um, I'm very skeptical on how they would be able to remember like the right. Sermon on the Mount. Is that put in the mouth? A lot of the stuff in the Gospels, I think, were put in the mouth of Jesus. I don't think okay. he actually said it. So I wonder if the same happens with Muhammad. Like later on. People okay. So, I mean, like, to be to be fair. Okay. So, so let's say that from a objective you know, point of view. Right. There's no evidence whatsoever to really confirm that the, that the Quran that you have right now, okay, came from the mouth of the Prophet. Right. right. Okay? There's no, I mean, you, you want to go, you want a time machine to go back and <laughs> yeah. see if you really, you know, said these things. I'm saying now from an object, objective, so you have the right to ask, you know, this or people think, oh, so how do we know that, you know, this Quran really came from his mouth or he really uttered these, you know, these, uh, these words. <laughs> Um, so that's a, uh, a legitimate question. So the issue here is that we can be there, there are, before I say that, so there was a movement, I would say 25, 30 years ago in academia, right? To date the Quran to 200 years after Muhammad's death, mm -hmm. right? And once bro, he wrote, you know, a book on that. Um, and then he basically advanced the idea that the Quran was collected during the Umayyad period, you know, later on, and then it was final because we don't have manuscripts. Again, he was, you know, basing his arguments uh, on the fact that because we don't have manuscripts and because of, you know, other arguments he was advancing, you know, he said that the Quran could be the earliest, you know, he could, uh, it, go, it could go back to the mid of the second century. So, so I'm doing Islamic time. So that would be eighth century, right? Um, but then uh, many people, there are people who followed this, right? They said, okay, well, you know, we follow one, one's bro's, uh, you know, argument and there are his students who also advocated for this opinion. There are many people in academia who didn't, right? And who said, well, we have uh, no reason uh, to say just because we don't have manuscripts to to doubt that the Quran was collected 200 years later. And the point I want to make is that not having a manuscript, mm -hmm. okay, at least let's say I'm talking about the Islamic tradition because there's a, a peculiar issue here about orality, okay? Orality. You see, the, the non-existence of a manuscript doesn't mean that a certain tradition did not exist. I agree with you. I'm not discrediting it right. my point is having confidence on knowing what came from muhammad like by the time we have actual manuscripts like you said there's 200 years right. i believe there's probably some kernels that go back mm -hmm. to muhammad himself sure but i ask you as an expert who's looked mm -hmm. into this do we have reason to say some of the things that are said of muhammad supposedly mm -hmm. coming from his mouth probably weren't actually said from him but were mm -hmm. embellished uh, traditions put in the mouth of Muhammad over time. And eventually they, all right, we need to write this stuff down and this needs to be um, for sure. We need to have this and save this literature. I mean, so over time, over how many years? So over, I don't know. I mean, b because we can be, we can, I don't want to say we can be, you know, certain, but we have confidence that, from the narratives that we have and from, you know, manuscripts that are surfacing, but even forget about manuscripts, you know, right. Right. Um, that the, from other sources, like, so if you just don't only look at Quranic manuscripts, you have, you have to look at also other works in the Arabic and Islamic tradition, right? right. So when you have works on grammar, go, let's go to a secular, you know, field, not just, you know, Quran or Islam. I mean, everything is intertwined, right? right? So when you go to works of grammar and you go to works on jurisprudence and you go to miscellaneous works that that we have manuscripts of, that were they were written in the early uh, 8th century or even late, you know, 700s, okay? And they were also transmitted from one person to another. And from these books... And they come from different groups. They don't just come from the court, you know, of the caliph who was controlling everything and who wanted to propagate it, you know, a certain, no. There were many different factions, right? And the empire, if you want to call it, they didn't, there are many groups who were opposing the central government, but they were also writing. 
most of these people they were writing in these books on grammar, literature, poetry, jurisprudence, the text of the Quran as it appears in these books, okay, it's more or less the same. Hmm. You see? So you don't need a manuscript of the Quran to tell you that people in the 8th century and in the late, you know, in the 700s, that they were using a text of the Quran as they were using it 200 or 300 years later on. Right. Now, was it the whole text? No, they were excerpts. Of course, it's not, you know, the whole text, but all the excerpts that you have in these early works of literature, grammar, jurisprudence, uh, they were people... You have to understand that a tradition takes time. So mm -hmm. if people were using these texts and these Quranic, you know, uh, uh, verses um, as textual evidence for, let's say, a work on grammar, okay, or a legal aspect, you know, these verses were already set in the culture. People know them. It's not, you know, a person who said, oh, well, you know, I found, you know, in a Quranic manuscript hidden somewhere this verse and other people didn't know about it. Right? right. And that's why, you know, scholars who opposed Wonsbro and other, you know, scholars from that perspective is that we already know that the Arabic slash Islamic tradition from the early on, the text was more or less standardized. Yes, there are issues. We can talk about that in some verses, the variant readings, codices that they were abrogated. Uh, certain codices that are different even in terms of syntax, you know, from, from the standard, you know, codex. All this is also recorded by Muslim scholars. So they were not, you know, if they found something that is different from the standard version that they were using, they already recorded that. They didn't, you know, say, oh, no, okay, well, this person, he has a codex or he has, you know, his own copy and it has this and it's different from the copy that we are using right now. Right. So my point is, from very early on, there is confidence that the text of the Quran is more or less standardized. Right. If you want uh, its syntax, okay, there are... Yes, problems and words and variants, pronunciations, etc. And some variants, they have different meanings. You know, there are different numbers of, of verses from one, uh, you know, uh, codex to, to another. Uh, but the assumption that the non-existence of a full Quranic manuscript right. uh, from the first century, that it should discredit the exist the existence of an early you know quran that's not something at least in academia that we i agree with you by the way i do we um, you know we we read i i one's bros book is on my reading list for right. for students it's a very you know i also advise and encourage people to read it it's not an easy read he's you know i had to read it multiple times to understand his english it's just <laughs> complicated it's English yeah. written in a French way of thinking. I don't know. It's, well, um, I, I want everyone to know yeah. when you said first century, he's speaking of the sixth century. Sorry, I, I, my OSX okay. is the Islamic calendar. So sixth century, sixth, seventh. Uh, I agree with you, by the way. What first we found, and seventh. Yeah. To use an example, what we found of New Testament manuscripts, the earliest we can get is late second century, but that's all right. we found. Mm -hmm. Who knows? There might be something earlier than that. We just don't exactly. have. And how much earlier is a big question. So I definitely agree with you that there's definitely something there. And if there is Jews and Christians in the region and they know about their textual traditions because they're encountering these people, I have, I mean, it's common sense to say they know that they have uh, standard ideas of text. And it's like, we need to get this right. And how it happened is where different traditions come in on trying to explain how we yeah, have got the Quran. Yeah, yeah. So if we could take this into problems um, mm -hmm. of variant readings, from what I understand, it's kind of like what we hear about Hebrew. Before um, there is kind of, I guess, a grammatical, uh, what we see with Masoretic Hebrew, you know, you have things that don't have uh, any grammar. So you're reading right. continuous. And if you don't know how to read this, yeah. you might have problems understanding what it meant in its actual original sure. language in Hebrew. Sure. But the rabbis later on actually were able to do that. And they have the Masoretic Hebrew text. Right. And it's almost a lot of scholars look at the Dead Sea Scrolls and go, this is very close. OK, mm -hmm. 
Right. It's not a hundred percent Xerox perfect, yeah. but there's a lot of things that are very close. And then there's some things though. There are these odd things like Jeremiah looks like the book of Jeremiah has been expanded quite a bit by the mm -hmm. later authors of the Masoretic. Whereas the Dead Sea Scroll has this kind of skeleton version. It's not quite as thick. There's mm -hmm. not as much material. So it's almost like the commentator in translator added things. All right. I just wanted to get that out of the way to say, in terms of variants and problems and contradictions, what are some of the big ones? Because I have a book here on my shelf, and this is kind of basic, right? This is corrections and 20 examples of corrections in early Quran manuscripts. Are there any major ones that you would say are like they it, like anyone who's serious in the research here might bump into and go, that changes like a lot of things if that is the actual reading that was original or whatever mm -hmm. is there something like that okay so first let's get this out of the way in terms of variant readings people uh, in, in even in academia and outside academia they always consider variant readings as uh, a way it's as if if there are if there is a difference in meaning mm -hmm. between two variants it's like okay, voila. Okay, here we here we go. You have you know two words which are different. So which one is the original intention, right? Right. And what I always say, and I said that in in my writings and in lectures, is that we have more serious problems in even words that do not have variants that were and still are interpreted differently. That they give different interpretations, even though that they don't have any variations. Can you, you give us an example? Some of these examples. I mean, the the uh, eternal uh, struggle, you know, between different groups in you know of uh, of Islamic uh, you know faith is the attributes of God. Okay, uh, does God have a hand? Does He have a throne? Okay, does He speak? The, the words are very clear in the Quran, but the interpretation of how people interpreted them, you know, does he ha really have a hand or the hand is a metaphor for his power? Okay. And this is a huge split between different factions that one faction would lead to consider the other factions blasphemous. If you say that God has a real hand, you are not a Muslim. Even both are Muslims, but they, you right. know, and the other group is that, what do you mean that this is metaphorical? You can't just, you know, say that this is metaphorical. So what about this? Is also prayer metaphorical? Is fasting metaphor metaphorical? So where, where do you draw the line between what is metaphorical and what is not? I laugh because this is the same thing I hear in Christianity all the time. I mean, it's it's everywhere. It's not right. even in uh, you know in Buddhists um, do this, Hindu do this, Muslims, uh, I mean, everybody last, does this. Last year we were all you know locked you know in in our, in our houses. I was watching uh, la was it last year or two years ago the hearings of the Supreme Court. Yeah, yeah, there were two of them or three of them, and. You know, I was just, you know, home, I think, uh, and I was watching them working. And then it was the first time for me hearing Supreme Court hearings. I never, you know, heard those, but they were all the time on, on the news channel. So I was working and just the TV is on. And then they were discussing certain issues on the interpretation of the Constitution. OK, the originalists and the textualists. And I said, this is the same exact thing that we have in the Islamic tradition. So you have people who wanted to interpret the Quran you know, according to the original intention, how it was revealed. And there are people who are textualists. No, we don't go back to the original. We, we take it as is. And this is just a constitution. It's a legal document. It's not right. revelation, I would assume, <laughs> you know, from, uh, it from depends anyone. Depends on who you ask. <laughs> depends on, well, yeah. You know but what I mean. The, the point is, as you mentioned, this approach to interpretation, it's everywhere. Yeah. Okay. So back to the question of variants and words. So I'm saying that there are many issues in the Quran that there are no variants in it. And they words that they, the people agree, this is how it is. And the different interpretation of what these words, they lead to completely different ideologies and different perspectives on even, you know, the nature of monotheism in Islam. Right. right. So now back to variants. The main problem with variants is, um, again, the issue of the Quran is the word of God. OK, but people also misunderstand what does it what does it mean? The word of God, the, the Arabic word is Kalam. 
So when you hear the word of God, you would assume that God is speaking and people say, oh, well, God spoke this way. But also Muslims have different interpretations of what word means, okay? Or how does God speak? Does he actually speak? Does he speak with sounds, you know, and letters like us? Or is speech and a word for him is different from us? Is the Quran eternal? You know, if he, sp if he spoke the Quran, so is the Quran also, you know, if, I don't know if you hear that created or not created. Okay, is it, of it, yeah. is, it one of, is it one of the attributes of God? Is it, does it subside in him or is it outside of him? It's very complicated theological topic that also Muslims from time immemorial until today, they never agreed on. And I'm not saying about small factions. I'm saying about, you know, the majority of Muslims. You have big wow. two factions within, within Sunni Islam, not even considering outside Sunni Islam, right? So the main problems with variants is that you have um, the text, which is uh, which was unvoweled, as you said, no Masoretic version of the Quran. And you know, one of the issues is, or one of the questions that I ask in in, in the treatment of Qiraat is that is does the or did the non-existence of vowels cause the variant readings, or not? Right. Now, definitely, of course, this was a, a factor. Okay. If you have a perfectly vowel text, people would read the same, right? Mm -hmm. But the issue is this, people back then, they didn't have vowels. The vowels didn't exist, okay? And this was the script that, you know, people used. So it's their language. So let's say now, I don't know, I give you a sentence in English and I take the E's and A's and U's and O's from it. To what extent are you going to get the sentence right? Right. I'm gonna right. have I'm gonna have trouble for sure. It depends on it depends on the register mm -hmm. of the sentence. I think right. So if I'm giving you just a simple sentence and you know the context of it, I mean, look at how people are chatting today, right? They, yeah, they shortcut everything. Shortcut everything. You know, if if I'm not if I'm not aware of this acronym in chatting, sometimes I read things I don't understand what they are, and then I have to Google them. Okay, so right. yeah, uh, what was the other one? I uh, I know L O L, right? That's uh, but R R O. What's the R O F L? Roll on floor or yeah, there's there's different. Right. So people use it, but you know it has an acronym. But people who you who know who, people who know the context would would read it, or they would know how 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 what it spells, right? So the point is. Uh, it, it depends on the register. If the if the text is uh, if it runs smoothly and then it's it's comprehensible, uh, you wouldn't randomly put dots and vowels on the text uh, and read it different to what the syntax, mm -hmm. okay, or the discourse of the sentence says. That being said, there are several passages in the Quran which are ambiguous. And everyone knows that. And the Quran itself says that there are passages which are ambiguous in the text. So there are clear verses and there are ambiguous verses. And the problem is that many of, you know, these variants, so there are certain variants that have to do with, with dialects, pronunciation, etc. But there are many variants which have to do with using different verb stems. You just, meant, you know, like, you know, uh, in Hebrew, if you don't have the vowels, Sometimes, not sometimes. If you don't have the vowels and you are beginning to learn the language, how do you how do you vowel how do you vocalize that? Um, and some of these, uh, many of these readings, they have to do actually with with the, who is doing the action. Is it an active? Is it passive? Is God doing that, or is it someone else doing that? Um, a plural, singular. Okay. Um, what else? Uh, pronouns. Uh, okay. So there are many, uh, I would say more than 50% or 60% of the variants. These are even the standard variants that they have nothing to do with dialects or pronunciation that actually they, ha they stem from the nature of the language itself. Okay. Should I use energetic form here or should I use the normal form? Should I use a causative verb or should I not use a causative verb? 
So a theological problem, you know, for the variants is what is the intention? Okay, what really, what does the, the verse really say? Mm -hmm. uh, if, if, if the meaning changes, but even if the meaning doesn't change, how did the prophet receive his revelation? Did he receive it in, you know, this reading or the second one or the third one? And of course, you know, you have a uh, uh, certain narratives in the tradition that want to reconcile that. Well, before the prophet died, you know, Gabriel came to him and then he recited the Quran in those seven different readings huh. or versions. Are there variants that you would say don't fall in that category that are obvious issues? Um, so you mean like such as? Um, such as like the grammatical issues that like what we talked about, how the Hebrew uh, is not vowed and then you have right. vowed. Um, it, are there some variants that we know don't match previous sources? Like I've heard, mm. this is probably taking you off track and I hate doing this, but I'm just, things that I've heard. That sure, they sure. found manuscripts with writing and that they know that this was written over the top of an older right, right. Of Arabic uh, verse and it's not the same or there's problems or something. Yes, yes. Yeah, no, no. Th this is, uh, again, without, the man without having the manuscript, we already have records in the tradition that says that we did have codices that they are different in their arrangement and syntax from the standardized version. So... Right. That's not, again, uh, you know, oh, if we found the palimpsest or we found the manuscript. We already have this information, the tradition. And I think I mentioned something, you know, earlier that also theologians were struggling with this issue. Okay, so what does it mean that several companions of the prophet, they were reciting uh, verses that they are significantly different from the standardized text? Okay. Mm -hmm. And again, the solution is a theological solution. It's not a uh, real solution. The solution is, well, this was the recitation of the companions of the prophet during that time, and this recitation was abrogated for one reason or another, similar to other verses in the Quran that were abrogated. Okay, now there are people who believe in abrogation. There are people who don't believe in abrogation, but the uh, theological solution is that these, yes, these readings, they exist. We have these codices. We record what, you know, Ibn Mas'ud, Ubay, all these companions of, uh, you know, of the Prophet recited, but they give it the label of their recitation. Is this where the burning... They distinguish between our, so it's like Muslims probably starting from the second, from eighth century, they would refer to the standardized version as our codices or our version versus their, i.e., the people 100 years before us, right? And this raises, of course, the, you know, it raises the problem of, uh, so you have really different, I mean, I don't like the word version because it's not, you know, um, it's not a, a one book and then another version of, of this book. It's just there are verses which are, I would say, significantly different in syntax. And they are recorded you know, we have the manuscripts which show that, but also they are recorded in the sources. And so, I yes, it is a problem, really and, and uh, Muslim theologians struggle to, to try to reconcile this uh, this issue. Yeah, Church fathers did the same thing. And I just want anyone who's knowing, like, this is not new. This is something, you know, someone might go, like, someone who's watching this is already, uh, if they are Muslim, they might be reconcil reconciling this in their head, going, see, we have all the tradition, and they knew what was true. Uh, the church fathers did the same thing. They said, we have it. We go right back to Peter. We have the truth. And like they, they yeah. tried to lay claim to having the origin. Wasn't there burning of some of these manuscripts? Right. Yes. So when, you know, the third caliph of man, according to the, the narrative, the tradition, right? So uh, when they collected the, so there was the first collection. And then according to the, to this narrative that there was a second collection because people, Muslims, were reciting the Qur'an differently. So that's, again, probably the beginning of the variant readings. And it seems that there, these variant readings were not issues of pronunciation or vowels. Otherwise, they would have put the vowels. They didn't have the vowels, but it seems that people were reciting differently uh, syntactically, not just, you know, uh, a variant word here and there. 
And this is what caused the second collection. So what Othman did is that he formed a committee. Um, and there are also problems with this tradition we can talk about, of this narrative, but he formed a committee. Um, they created the a copy, which is the main codex, and then they made copies of that codex. And the copies differ. There are many traditions where they four, five, six, seven, so it's either between four and 11, and they sent it to different cities, to Iraq, to uh, you know Bahrain, etc. Um, and what he did is that the existing uh, codices that the companions of Muhammad possessed, that he forced them from their holders, and then he burned them. Okay, or in other tradition, he, you know, uh, he was he he tore them apart, uh, but he burned them, and then so that uh, there were only one version would survive. Okay, which is the version that we have right now. So this, despite this fact, we do have uh, there are you know a companion Ibn Masoud who refused to uh, give his own codex, his own copy, uh, to burn it, and then he kept it. And we do know that even 100 years later, or probably even more, in, in Iraq, uh, that they were still reciting using this codex or this version of Ibn Masoud. And then it slowly died down, you know, after second century, it's like 8th century, mid, mid, you know, probably after the 800s, it started to die down. But many of the particulars of these readings were recorded in sources. And, and how, I think around how, yeah. the 800s is when there's like this scientific revolution, actually. Mm -hmm. There's yeah. like this really interesting, um, you know, where, where Islam was on top of the world when it came to scientific uh, studies. And they were looking, from what I understand, to Greek sources. I don't want to rabbit trail there, but like they knew, I think, from the conquering of Byzantine and whatnot, mm -hmm. they had all these Greek uh, ancient science books yes. and really, really did some deep knowledge on this. So, of course, I mean, uh, yeah, they, uh, again, they were not uh, isolated even before Islam and after Islam. They were not isolated from what was happening, you know, around them. And even as early as, you know, the Umayyads who came to power after the uh, the fourth caliph, uh, they were hiring people, you know, as scribes from Byzantium, you know, who were bilingual, also from the Persian Empire who fell, you know, afterwards. Uh, they were hiring these people to run the state. Huh. Okay. And so that's clever, clever. Yeah, and this is the kind of continuity and how, you know, the different traditions from Byzantium and from uh, from Persia, they were all uh, in a melting pot, in a, you know, in a sense, alongside, you know, the Bedouinized, if you want, Arabic, uh, you know, culture coming from, uh, from Arabia. Um, and it is the reason why you move the capital to the north, right? So there's virtually, you have desert, right, in Arabia. So if you want to create an empire, you move north. You don't right. start from Mecca. And this is why, you know, the fourth caliph, you know, he left Medina and then he went to Kufa, to, to Iraq. This is where the, the Persians were. So he didn't stay in, you know, there were, of course, there were political conflicts there, but you move up. And then his rival, who established the Umayyad dynasty, he went to Syria, where the Byzantine were. Hmm. So you start the expansions and the empire from the north. You don't start it from from the desert it's very difficult right. to do that so a couple questions and then i'd like to get into some other stuff here is the you rent you sent me the articles i was reading of some other scholarly work on the archaeology and i like my simple question i know it's not easy to answer probably is the kaaba and i hope i'm saying the right the kaaba yeah um this some people want to argue has pagan origins others will argue that it's potentially working within the Judaic or even Christian temples in the region. Right. So they're kind of doing both uh, in a way. There's a stone and there's this controversy surrounding this that Muhammad is still making this something that is holy. Like it's something that they must practice as part of the religion. Right. Based on your scholarly research, and this may not be your particular specialty, but what you've understood in your research – is this a pagan origin and is this something only from that region? Because some tr traditionalist, if you will, will try to say Abraham built this house, you know, and, they, and maybe there's some traditional truth. I'm trying to stretch here a little 
yeah. and saying, okay, what if it's a, a synagogue or a Christian original uh, temple or, or building? And in that w- in that kind of way, you could say, well, it's Abrahamic, but yeah. there seems to be some pagan influence too on the Kaaba, and that's something that's foreign from Christianity and Judaism. So, sure, what do you uh, know about the Kaaba? So, so I mean, the first thing is that the uh, what we know again from the sources and from archaeology that the, the Kaaba was not is not unique. There were other Kaabas right. in Arabia, right? A red one, a red stone, and a white stone. Yeah. So, so there were many of them. So it was a uh, something that is common in that region, and we have uh, uh, two early books, I think, from the eighth century, ninth century you know, on pagan pre-Islamic Arabia written by Muslim authors. And they describe some of these Kaabas. There's like 11 of them or 12 of them. And Mecca was not the biggest. So there was even bigger, you know, Kaabas in the south in Najran or in Taif, right? Um, so the origins, again, I mean, I am not an, an expert, you know, on this. And even archaeology is limited, unfortunately, for... You know, political reasons. It's. I don't think it's. Uh, uh, you know, it's not easy to do excavations, yeah. and you know, in this in this part of of uh, of the world. Uh, so maybe if hopefully there will be more excavations in the future, we would know more. Um, but who built the Kaaba? You know, Abraham or Ishmael or so, I don't know. No, <laughs> no one knows, right? And the tradition said uh, it's it's even built. Uh, there, there's a tradition that it was Adam when he yes. descended, when he descended from heaven. You know, this is where he landed, and this is where they they built the Kaaba, right? <clears throat> so these are all you know traditions that uh, you know they can fall into the category of uh, you know myths. Um, some people would take them uh, literally, and this is really what happened. I can't verify that. No one can. <clears throat> but in terms of pagan practices, I mean, we for sure, the Kaaba before Islam was a center for the Arab pagans. There were idols there. It was worshipped, right, by the uh, by the pagans. Now, originally, was was this the purpose for it, or was it an Abrahamic shrine? And then it turned into a pagan practice. I'm not sure. An expert on this can can explain that. From right. the the, re- the readings I did, that probably yes, as you said, it, it, it probably it was a um, um, a synagogue or you know a, a square for a church, and then it turned you know into uh, a pagan shrine with idols. Yeah, I've just heard. Like, just like a church would turn into a mosque. Right. Or a mosque exactly. Would turn into a church. So that so, was what I found that I thought was beautiful in a way. It shows the humanity. And this is what I like to point out. I find beauty in this. You yeah. know, where people have a religious experience from the tradition, I get what's kind of a religious experience from the the history of what's really going on. I love to find this out. And it demystifies all of the myth, if you will. Um, yeah. This this there, there was a Byzantine artwork in yes. early mosque and things yeah. like this. And even I heard in that uh, PDF you sent me a Barbara, someone from Germany. I, right. I think her name is Barbara. Let I mean, me ask you not even not, not even that. There was an expedition. <clears throat> there was an expedition in the 80s, I think, in, in 1981 or 1982 by German and Saudi uh, archaeologists. Okay. Um, and they did excavations. Uh, in a place called the Fa F A W, right? So it was it seems that it was a center of trade between beneath Mecca before Mecca started to flourish. Right. So this place, it seems that it was a flourishing trade center before Mecca, 100, 150 years before Mecca, right? And they published the uh, the findings. Um, the, the, you can find the, the book online. It's just like excavations of, of Qaryat al Fau, Q A R Y A T A L F A W. And there are pictures of dolphin, like um, statues, right? And inscriptions of dolphins, of Byzantine, uh, you know, shoes and, you know, accessories. So fi- even in the, in the 400 AD, that's 200 years before Islam, yep. right? There were. There was trade happening between the north and the south, and Arabia or Hejaz. It was not an isolated 
place that they were not they did not know what was happening around them they also had crosses uh, inside of the some of the right. artwork i mean it not like what we see with jesus on it but like symbols um symbols yeah i must ask you this i've heard this said and i know i need a scholar's angle here because there are people who bash islam who have a statement and 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 not all people who think this bash islam but they're it's kind of like this narrative that's spread allah wasn't just the name for god but it was a actual designated deity among the pantheon of pre islamic arabic tribes that that had multiple gods but it may have been like the supreme god and i'll use an example here so that people understand that i'm not coming out trying to be rude at all yahweh for example the god of abraham in the old testament he was the god of gods he sat on a throne he reigned over a council of other gods when you read in genesis he says let us make man in our image this is a divine council and he is the god above all gods just like marduk mm -hmm. is the god above all gods in the pantheon of the mesopotamian deities at some at some point and then it might have been Enlil or different deities so is but, Allah i mean it's i mean this image is also to what extent it exists in the quran not in in this kind of description but right. you know the image of god sitting on a throne and the angels are you know are around him and then even in the in in, in the when when god speaks he speaks with the we which right. is interpreted in grammar to be the majestic we right. but there are also other scholars but sometimes he's sometimes god says i sometimes we right so right. there are other scholars who said this we it it implies this kind of pantheon like this right. image of a, of a king or a god sitting on a throne and surrounded by the angels so yes the image is there right um is the name allah though does that derive from the pre-islamic arabic uh pantheon where it's a, a specific i mean name? i i read that i'm not I, you know i i'm not an on an expert on this i read that it, you know it is how it is derived is it you know accurate to what extent i'm you know i don't know um you but know we have scholars who think that though right yeah and that's uh, i mean again deriving so what is the uh, I, again, I say, you know, people are, you know, uh, they, ha it's legitimate if, you know, if they think about these issues in, in you know, in that, uh, in that fashion. But so what's the alternative? Is that, is the alternative that the name Allah, for example, just came out of nothing? No, I was thinking one of so, two things. I, yeah. and maybe you can get where I'm coming from. The name just simply means God, right? And so right. it's kind of like saying Yahweh or like, like to the Israelites, they had the term for God. They might have used the term sure. El or like they'll actually say Hashem. They won't say right. God. They have a respectable term they use that that denotes God. Um, whereas the Jews or Christians even have God and they would say, you know, the Christ and the Father or whatever they might have as their, anal their analogy. I was thinking one of two things. The pre-Islamic pagan traditions uh, uh, had a pantheon with a specific deity that was the, the supreme deity and yeah. they incorporate this deity into their monotheistic uh, sure. new revelation yeah. where they say you're at the top and you are God, you are all, yeah. and it's one God. Or they are looking at the Christians and Jews idea of monotheism. They're saying, nah, you Christians are right only some, but you're wrong some. You Jews are right some, you're wrong some, but your idea of monotheism and we have the – in Arabic it just means God. So it's one of the two things I think, um, or or a combination of both. I don't see a problem that it's a combination of eclectic. both. Eclectic, yeah. And you know, and uh, the 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 name Allah it existed before Islam, right? So I mean, the 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 Prophet's father's name was the servant of God, like Abdullah, right? So the name existed before that. It's not. Uh, I mean, people have to understand that when Islam came and when when Muhammad was preaching Islam, he was not preaching something new okay so it's not you know he was saying something that people back then what are you saying we are not familiar with these notions right. no and even the stories the biblical stories that he was telling them they already knew these stories tell us about the story of alexander it's in the quran it says you know they ask me they're asking us about alexander tell us about they knew who alexander was 
if it's Alexander, if the, the one with the two horns, if it was Alexander or whoever. Right. I'm saying that the Joseph, you know, they know, tell us a story. And he would tell them the story. So they knew. He didn't tell them about Confucius or someone. <laughs> Good right? point. He didn't tell them about uh, someone in the East that they didn't know. No, all the stories in the Quran and all the concepts, they are pre-Islamic. They come from the pre-Islamic Near East context. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, no one would follow this man. Good point. What are you telling us? Who's Confucius? This if you want to tell us about someone great, you know, in the East, if he was a prophet, you know, or Buddha. He didn't talk about the Buddha, right? right. Why? So the, the point is, uh, when you talk about the origins of Islam, Muslims themselves, they don't say, well, Muhammad came and then he reinvented the wheel. No one says that. Islam is a continuity of Judaism and Christianity. That's that's the say. Now you want to say he plagiarized it? Okay, fine. You can say if this is what you know, if what you believe in. But uh, I'm saying that from uh, our perspectives and the way that we deal with that, it is only natural that you have a new religion. It it says itself that I am coming after Judaism and Christianity, and of course, it's going to incorporate many of. The, it's not going to, again, start things again. I'm just finishing things. Right. Now, whether this is true or not, whether people like that or not, that's another issue. So the name of God, of Allah, whether it came from, you know, the, uh, the pagan pantheon incorporated into the monotheism of Christianity and Judaism, uh, Judaism that's normal. Ch just as many Islamic practices were pagan practices and they were incorporated into Islam. Pilgrimage, for example, right? Yep. It's the same, I mean, it is described in the, in the Muslim sources how pagan Arabs were doing pilgrimage around the Kaaba. The, the, the things that they were saying even, like it's exactly the same phrases that Muslims now say when they are doing pilgrimage, it's exactly the same phrases that the pagans were using, but you replace the name of the idol with the name of God. That's it. Holy shnikes. I, lo I absolutely love this stuff. Yeah. And I actually want more Muslim friends. You know, I, I know that a lot of them that they won't like me because they're like, oh, you're, you're looking for the human origins, but like, there's going to be a lot of scholars, I think, that are Muslims that I'm going to have friends that are going to be friends of mine for this reason. I'm trying to take a balanced approach. As you can see, I really want to be respectable because I know it's sacred to many people, just like Christianity is sacred. I, I do poke holes because I yeah. was a Christian. And no, we have to poke holes. That's what we do. We, ha we I, you know, I mean, if other people are not comfortable with poking holes. Right. They just want... But uh, I think that's what we do in, uh, you know, in, in, in academia or, you know, we, we are curious and we want to poke holes. We, want, we are curious. We want to understand the origins of things. We want to, uh, and sometimes it would hurt other people's feelings. You know, I understand that. Uh, but, you know, I think that's a, uh, a grand quest. To, that's, to and that's not my goal. Yeah. My goal isn't to do that. It will do that no matter what. That's what's going to happen because people get offended. My goal is to try and not worry about what people feel. I'm only interested in what I can find out and learn and try to understand the origins because I think too many people just – they propagate this, this idea. It's their beliefs, but they propagate this idea, and then they want to pressure everyone else. Right, to believe right. their idea and i like no sorry i think you're wrong yeah. and if you're going to be allowed to run around telling other people they're wrong and that islam is the truth and that allah is going to burn me in hell and this this that and all this stuff right, right. and you're going to force people you know i'm no, sorry i I'm I, I agree that. with you and again that's my personal opinion so not not uh, not not to right. be footnoted you know <laughs> uh, is that you know mean what you are saying also applies uh, among muslims themselves right, right. so um, you see that there is a movement uh, you know from a, from a certain group to discredit other groups right and it's, it's vice versa so what's happening in the past also 30 years that you have uh, you know a group of muslims who are more active let's say you know on media probably internet in advocating 
what they think Islam should be or is, right? And actually, I mean, I don't have numbers, but you know, I, uh, this group of Muslims, they are the minority <laughs> in, uh, you know, so they are, I would say 10%, 15% maximum, maximum. Of, of, of Muslims, but they are the ones with the most resources, okay? And you have the other historically majority of Muslims, the 85%, who don't have such resources. Uh, it doesn't mean the, the 5% or 10% they are wrong. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that they're, they, they constitute a minority, you know, in Sunni Islam at least. Uh, and they pressure other people in what you are saying, is that this is what Islam is. And of course, you have the other 85% or 80%, they have different, you know, views on that. And they said, no, this is what Islam is. And they pressure each other, even without even going outside, is that, no, you don't know what you're saying. No, you don't know what you're saying. I am right, you are wrong. I think it happens everywhere. It's part of human nature, I would say, so. I did a live show on my channel, Dr. Nasir, and uh -huh. I had two Muslims, and they were arguing over a Quranic verse that talks about, uh, is it prepubescent girls uh -huh. or post-pubescent in the idea of, of Muhammad marrying Aisha and does the, I know, I know. And I was like, you're on a skeptic channel talking about this. Hello. But they don't, you know, they didn't care. And then two of them said, yes, this is pre pubescent and po post it's talking about both. It's not just mm -hmm. one. And yes, it's saying in this time, for whatever reason in the culture, this was acceptable, or at least they're saying this is what the prophet did. And this is okay that he consummated with a nine-year-old. Now, we, to our standards, you already know how that is. I don't even want to go there. Sure, we sure. know today we don't accept this, or at least mm -hmm. in America. Right. The world might think differently. But the other guy said, are you kidding me? And he started to yell. He called the other guy a Taliban. I was, like, <laughs> I was like, oh, my gosh, did you just call him a Taliban? And, like, I didn't even have to poke holes. I just sat back. I grabbed my popcorn. You were, you were, you were enjoying the show, huh? So. <laughs> well, after about an hour of talking about women's, you know, uh, periods, I was like, okay, this is no more. Let's stop. Let's talk something else. You know, it's, uh, I, I find it amusing that, uh, mostly really men, you know, they discuss these issues, you know, whether, you know, the wife of the prophet was nine or eight or whatever. And then you don't have women themselves who are, probably more concerned with this issue and then they want to discuss it how it wow. is it's always coming from the other side i don't know but uh uh yeah i heard some of these you know uh, debates etc so it's uh it's unfortunate that even with an issue like that you know it leads people to consider the other person blasphemous yeah. if they don't think it's before 9 or after 9 so yeah. yeah, either way, I want to share with you a final, uh, let's have a little final fun here. Sure. We get to watch another, um, I believe he's a doctor, and um, he, he's definitely educated, but he was interviewed by Muhammad um, Hijab. Have you ever heard of Muhammad Hijab? I heard of the name, yes, yeah. He's a pretty I, aggressive. I, I don't know much about him, but I, I heard some of my friends, they bring up his name, yeah. Yeah, I, from what I have seen, he seems to be quite aggressive in his approach. Um, here he is having a conversation with, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Yasir Qadi? Yes. Yasir Qadi? Okay. I'm going to play something. I don't know where I'm actually at here. Um, let's go with this. This is on my buddy Abdullah Samir's channel. He's an ex-Muslim, but he's trying to point out something that's going on here. And Muhammad Hijab actually removed 30 minutes of the clip, I guess, that was there. Um, because you're going to see, and I'd love to get your comment. Yeah, and he did something unethical. Uh, he was expelled from the list, and the list was basically banned because of that stuff, because of that. He couldn't refute to my argument, so he sent it to uh, one of your madkhalis in uh, uh, in, uh, in England. And so then, of course, this madkhali gave it to the other one, and so obviously, and he, everything, you know, uh, you know, all whatever broke loose. But again, this was not something I brought up in public, and I would never bring it up. And I don't think it is wise to bring it up to public. Every single student of knowledge knows who studies Quran that the most difficult topics are Ahruf al-Qiraat. 
and the concept of Ahruf and the reality of Ahruf and the relationship of the Malik Musa with the Ahruf and the preservation of the Ahruf is it one, is it three, is it seven and the relationship of the Qira'at to the Ahruf. This is a topic that when you're the beginning, beginning student of knowledge, you're like, what is all of this going on here? When you go a little bit more, you learn to simply memorize what your teachers say and regurgitate it out. And you don't fully comprehend. When you do a deep dive is when things get very, very awkward and difficult. And this isn't new. This is from the time of the Sahaba. In the Sahih or the Hassan Hadith of Ubay Ka'b, the Hadith of the Ahruf, that when the Prophet mentioned the issue of Ahruf, and that there are different Ahruf and whatnot. This is in the version of Muslim Ahmad. Umayy bin Ka'b says, authentic hadith, shak. In my heart, a doubt came that I hadn't had about Islam since the days of Jahid. This is not a joke, brothers and sisters. The issue of Ahruf and Qira'at caused confusion to somebody whom the Prophet said, if you want to listen to the Quran directly, listen to Ubay. Ubay is not some even average Sahabi. He is the Qari of the Qur'an. He is the master. He is who he is. And he goes, What is all of this stuff? And the Prophet, and the Prophet put, it, yeah. put his hand and then he goes, So, so okay, can we comment on this just for a second on what you see so far? And then there's maybe a little more because Hijab tries to really pressure him. And he's like, I told you I didn't want to bring this public or whatever. Um. What 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 did you hear there so far from what he said? Do you do you pick up on what he's putting down there? <clears throat> well, I'm not uh, I'm not aware of the the context of the conversation what they were talking you know after, but you know at least from from this I you know I mean it's right that the issue of um, uh, of the variant readings right or the ahruf it is problematic from a theological perspective right. Um, but it depends from how you look at it. You know, it wasn't a problem, you know, you know, for it depends how you look at it. If you want to say, well, the, the Quran is one and it is the word of God. And then you have, you know, all these variant readings. If you belong to a certain theological school, then it is a problem, you know, for you. If God is really uttering all these variants, uh, if you are not, and if you belong to other school, you know, it's not really an issue if you just follow the syntax and then the pronunciation of the words and how they are performed, you know, they vary. Um, but the issue of uh, something that should be, you know, brought up in public or not, it's, uh, you know, I think it's something that people want to maybe protect the public from, you know, uh, certain issues that would cause doubt now is this uh, right or wrong that's not my uh, uh, it's it's not for me to say you know right. uh, whether these things should be brought in public or not but there are certain issues that you know the, the issue of of variant readings it's not something that is hidden uh you know it's just not a, it's just not known it, yeah, it's not hidden, you know, and locked in a in a safe box where you will only be given the keys. Uh, you know, <laughs> you at, it's not. You can, money. anyone in the past 1400 years, you go to a bookshop, you pick up a copy of variant readings and then you read it. It's there, right? So I think the issue is to what extent this issue of variant readings of the or Qira'at uh, how important they are uh, for the average Muslim to know. And I think this is this is probably what, uh, you know, I can't speak on his behalf, but this is what I would say the, um, uh, what most people would think. Um, I think we are now in an age where it's very difficult to keep things uh, hidden right. or away from public with the internet. You know, I remember when I was, <clears throat> When I wrote my dissertation, which is my first book, I start 2007, eight. Okay. Uh, now there was no tube. I don't think there was YouTube back then. Uh, you know, so I was basically writing uh, everything based on the resources that we have in the library. Um, I didn't. There were there were no uh, 
uh, search engines as sophisticated as you have now. Now you have websites on different recitations, uh, audio and YouTube channels and lectures. So it's very difficult now to keep this issue uh, from the public, right? Right. Um, so, yeah, so that's, uh, you know, I, I would say that uh, I understand where he's coming from. Uh, now, whether this is right or wrong, uh, I think it's up for debate for, you know, experts in pedagogy, you know. To what extent can we, I mean, I, again, this happens, I think, in, in all traditions, not just in, uh, you know, in Islam. To what extent can we keep certain information away from the public? Okay, and to what extent this is important? And this is an issue that you find in books of creed, you know, in Islamic creed, or they say aqidah, you know, uh, which me in in some in, in in many texts, classical texts, where the average Muslim is encouraged to not pursue certain questions that would cause doubt. Yeah, he talks about that. In fact, if I could continue playing a little longer, and then we're going to wrap things up here, just sure. to show you what he's saying here. My buddy Samir, I loved this little clip that he took because this is from the actual original, and I'll let Samir be seen here. So. Muslims don't need to know about Quran preservation. It'll hurt the iman and cause more doubt. Like Yasir Qadi said, it's not wise to discuss these issues in public. Better that we keep it behind closed doors. There, there was, was even a bigger, bigger bombshell that, that came later. And by the way, this is now a well-known open secret amongst many Muslim graduate students and, and, and academics around the world. And, and this, this is well-known. The traditional understanding of Ahruf and Qiraat cannot answer some of these pressing questions that are now being hooked by our uh, people outside of, by our academics, not our, by their academics outside of the faith tradition. You see, in a Muslim environment, there's always some respect that we have for the Quran. We should. In a Muslim environment, we'll press a little bit and then we'll say, okay, khalas, and I will talk. And that's great, alhamdulillah. When you go to academia, they don't have that red line. And they're going to just, you know, the, 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 the famous story of the emperor with no clothes. They're going to just point out, no, that doesn't make any sense. Well, that's not true. And this and that. And they'll bring issues, which I'm not going to mention explicitly, that you know are true because they're in your own books. They're not inventing anything new. They'll bring you riwayat and they'll bring you athar, and then you add to that very well-known issues of, I don't even want to be explicit. And then you bring on top of that makhlutat, and then and then. And it's very clear to you and to every single very advanced student and specialist that the standard narrative has holes in it. That's what I'm going to say. The standard narrative does not answer some very pressing questions. Okay, this is what I'm going to say. Well-known secret among so, academics. Of course, he's my buddy Samir is like pointing out like this is a big deal for traditionalists. And then here's hijab pressing back real quick. To try and make this as specific as possible, I think. If I were to give you a blank mushaf, yeah, and uh, and tell you to write what is munazzal verbatim from Allah into that mushaf with no human interference, would you write something which corresponds? It's to not an easy answer. It's not an easy yes or no. It is enough for the Muslim to believe that the I think Quran this should is... be an easy yes or no, though. Yes, I, I, I have it. to. Okay, very, very well. So, yeah, Muhammad, after we get off this phone call, me and you must have a number of discussions. No problem. I'm very open with advanced students. But these issues should not. Look, it is Kalamullah, what is going to be written. It is Kalamullah. What, 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 what would you write? Uh, 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 you let's write? not. Let, let's. You, you're pushing me, and I'm saying it's not hikmah to listen. I have a condition. Like I said, everything I say is going to be factual. If I wanted to do tawli and whatnot, I would do it right now in front of you. There is no need for tawli. The Quran is the uncreated speech of Allah. The Quran is preserved. The Quran is known. The Quran is mutawatir. And alhamdulillah, all of the qiraat are the Quran. All of the qiraat are authentic. Alhamdulillah. Leave it at that, ya Beyond this, honestly, I have no problem. We'll have a discussion or take my class. But beyond this requires background information. It is enough for the Muslim to know that the Quran is the speech of Allah that has been protected and what we recite is the kalam of Allah. That is enough for the Muslim to know. I, I appreciate I wanted to say saying, one thing. But I, I, look. And then there anyway, that, that has it. I'm done doing that to you. <laughs> yeah. I just wanted you as an academic who is the person who's capable and willing to go past the red line that they're describing that their academia 
we as Muslims, he says, we can only go so far and then we just uh, we kind of back off because it's there in a lot of ways that I guess his particular tradition is like, I am not willing to go beyond that. I'll give you an example. I have Christian scholars that are really good friends of mine who actually appreciate what I do. And it's like, what? Christians that I talk to on the regular basis say, how can he be your friend? How can he appreciate what you do? You, you know, and then I ask these scholars, these are Christians in academia. Did Jesus uh, predictions about the apocalypse fell? And they mm -hmm. say, yes. Uh, mm -hmm. they, in, in other words, yes. And you go, hold on. You believe he's God in the flesh and he got predictions wrong. How can you do that? And they go, well, this is my subjective. Um, my, I'm combining my academic training, my historical training and my faith, which is subjective. They don't have anything to technically, they don't right. really, uh, cause the other one false. Like for me, I don't know how, right. I'm like, how can you, you know, even I'm like shocked because I came from a Christianity where it can't be wrong. And if it's wrong, sure. I mean, it's, it's the same. I mean, I think one of the, I mean, there are a few things I, I would, I would comment on, uh, but, uh, but just very quickly on your point, I think one of the problems in, I wouldn't call it a problem issues, let's say in all traditions is that when you subscribe to a certain faith, uh, you feel that of course that, you know, you have the mandate of God, right. And you are right. And, you know, anything that happens, uh, you are in within this faith, you know, it's being inspired directly. So that's natural human, uh, uh, you know, reaction to questions, doubts, etc. I believe it's the same in Christianity and Judaism. You know, you, you are, you know, that better than me. Right. Um, but uh, I, I don't want to, uh, you know, you know, go into detail in, uh, in, in, in the response, but I think, you know, there's, the, the question is problematic that uh, this, uh, this is hijab, the, the, uh, Muhammad hijab. Yeah. I think his, his question is problematic. The question is the premise of the question is, is not accurate, right? To say that if I'm going to give you a paper and write down what is, and you know, revealed from God. The, the problem is once you, once things get, if you, again, we are believing, we are talking theology now, once things get to earth <laughs> from, from the heavens and you start writing things down, there's a human interference. Right. Right. So the premise of the question is problematic when you say, well, okay, write for me now, what is verbatim, revealed from God, you, the question is wrong because you can't combine something which is, you know, oral and then represented accurately in writing. And this is the whole issue of orality and orality writing. versus written. And this is why Muslim scholars never called a written codex. They never called it Quran. Now you go to a bookstore and then you buy, you know, the Quran, it's written on it Quran. And it shouldn't be written on it, Quran. It should be written on it, Mus'haf, which means codex. And that's what many institutions do. They call it the Mus'haf. They don't call it Quran. You shouldn't right. be calling a written text Quran, at least according to the tradition, you know? So that's the, the distinction when people think, well, okay, I have a printed edition or I have a written version and this is the Quran. That's the issue here. The distinction between the oral and the written, right? Wow. So, uh, you know, as for, you know, the answer, whether, you know, things in, in academia and in Western academia uh, being more critical or Muslim scholars don't probe, I, I may disagree a little bit with this because in the sources, Muslim scholars probe these issues. We are not bringing, I mean, he himself said that we do have hadiths and accounts that said this and that it tells you that even Muslim scholars, they were probing and poking holes. They were not just sitting and then saying, okay, well, this is what we have, everything is beautiful. No, they knew that there were problems. 
Right. And they were poking holes. And there are many traditions and had the and discrepancies, again, which I talked about before, is that because you have discrepancies, because Muslim scholars, they were poking holes, what's happening with variants? This is a mistake. This is a scribal error, uh, error. You know, um, uh, you know, how do we reconcile, you know, the, you know, the different discrepancies that we have in the tradition? They did poke holes. But at the end of the day, it's you know, right. it's safe. You know, you say, okay, I have this. I did my best. Okay. I spent 40 years of my life uh, collecting variants, studying Arabic, you know, trying to verify every single word in the Quran. This is what I got. I did my best. God knows best. That's the attitude, right? And that's what he sounded like on there. And then when, the, when Hij yeah. Hijab kept pressuring him, he's like, stop. And, you know, he sounds for me as someone who is a skeptic, kind of a like a conservative Muslim. Like he is, even though he's expanded his knowledge quite a lot, he's still very conservative in saying this is true. But to hijab, he's liberal. You can tell he's like, oh, no, this should be an easy answer. And it's like, you know, because there's this teaching going on where it's like, yeah. no, you need to accept it because this is what is the truth. And there's no. Right. I mean, you, you, you wouldn't assume someone who is advocating for his own religion or faith to say, well, no, I have problems. Right. Right. With my no one would say that in any tradition. So, of course, you want to uh, if you want to sell your product, you know, you can't sell something. And say, Oh, well, it's it's defective. There are problems here and there. No, you want to sell it in a beautiful, embellished way. And then after people believe, you start poking, <laughs> you know, if you want. Uh, yeah. Whether this is a right approach or not, again, that's people can discuss it. But I do understand where he's coming from. Uh, I wouldn't. Uh, I think the issue here is not. The issue here is, uh, it's a conversation about what should we, uh, to what, how much should the average Muslim know? Right. Right. And I don't know about also maybe in Christianity and Judaism, it's the same. How much should they? I mean, does every single Christian know the details about the Trinity? For example, I don't know. I'm asking you, you know, do, oh, like, no, no, no. And like, do they really know the different, you know, philosophical, theological differences yeah. between what this is the body of the Christ and the spirit? Do they, yeah. they know that people say the Trinity, right? You know, you hear it, but probably you know, the huge percentage of Christians, they don't understand what the Trinity is and the theological discussions from the very beginning. They just think, okay, the Trinity, and that's it, right? And the same in, in, in Islam, you know, the average Muslims, they don't know the details of, of the theological debates that happen, but it's there, and it's, it's in the books. And if you want to pursue it, you do need to undergo some kind of training, okay, to accurately capture it. So... Um, you know, good. So uh, hard luck for, <laughs> for whatever, <laughs> but uh, I do understand uh, where he's coming from. So I'm, you know, um, it's up for debate, you know, whether this is the right approach to educating people or not. That's another issue. Yeah. Yeah. Well, final question. Where do you see Islamic studies going uh, in the next let's say 100 years, for example, do you think just like Christianity, um, it will become more of a discussed topic that, uh, for example, people can make cartoons of Jesus and not get killed, for example. Uh, do you think that this might happen where it will start to become okay to be critical uh, more? I'm not sure about that. It's... Uh... It, you know, it's all, it, it depends on whether Muslims want or will separate state from church. This is all what, what it matters, right? So right. if it happens in 100 years that there will be separation between state and church, as you have in Christianity, then people will do it. So I don't think, uh, you know, we reach that stage. And right. uh, as long as uh, uh, there's really no separation, between between both, I think it's very difficult to. Uh, uh, the, the premises again, there are Muslims who are who are calling for certain, you know, issues to be, especially in in the in, in the West, like right. American Muslims or European Muslims who are living in the states, and they are both, you know, they are Americans and Muslims, so they want to exercise their rights, 
as Americans, but also they are constrained by certain rules in Islam, right? And you have also the other groups of Muslims who are saying, no, we shouldn't be constrained by that. So the premises are, you know, once you resolve this issue of separation of state and church, uh, you might see that. If if you don't, then I think uh, it's not going to be okay to do cartoons uh, or other or or being uh, critical slash I don't know offensive. You know, like you could be. Uh, there are movies or caricatures on I see on, on Jesus or people do that, and it's not a problem here uh, because of this kind of issues. I don't think. Uh, in Islam, it's at this level yet. So, yeah. what will happen in the future? I don't know. God, God knows best. So, right, Doctor Shady uh, Shadi Nasir, I really yeah. appreciate you. Everybody, please go check out his website. He um, graduated. At, no, did you graduate from Harvard? I did. Yes. Okay. Yes, you did. And of course, you've public. You have many publications. Of course, two books specifically. The one I have in my Amazon link is the transmission of the variant readings of the Quran. It is not very easy to read, and it's also a little pricey here. But if you can get it and you're really interested in getting to a deep dive, highly recommend this work here. Also, the second canonization of the Quran. In this book, though, do you discuss specifically only the second canonization, or do you briefly give an overview of some of the other stuff prior and then after, or... Yeah, so uh, the first chapter, I just break down what what I mean by, you know, canonization and the different stages that, you know, the Quran underwent um, to its to the final form that we have right now. But the whole, the, the bulk of the book and the data at the end, it's mostly what I call the second stage, which is, you know, 10th century, where what we call the seven readings, I don't know if you heard that, around the seven canonical readings, how they were established uh, during that time. So it's mostly specifically on, on this period, but there's a breakdown at the beginning of the uh, of the other periods as well. Thank you so much. And ladies and gentlemen, if you like what I'm doing here at Myth Vision, you want to see more of this, you guys want to help us out. Not only do you have access to hundreds of videos, including this one we're recording right now on Patreon early, um, there are many others you haven't seen. You can get early access to that and join today. You also are helping us grow and keeping this thing alive so that I can make more trips to try and see more scholars and to do these things. Because to be honest with you, time is money. And a lot of the people I have come on, I I make sure that they're funded for their time and their expertise is valuable to me, which is why I, I go out of my way to offer them this. So you, my patrons, are a huge part of why I do what I do and I'm able to do this. Thank you so much. Please consider joining Dr. Nasir, once again, thank you so much. This has made me uh, appreciate the studies a little more rather than going to one side that hates it and seems to just like not value maybe the nuance and there's some depth to the development of Islam. Even though I don't believe it's divine, I still respect it in the way of like, how did this happen within a culture? What happened? Why do people create these things? And I'm fascinated with it from that angle. Um, then there's the other side that says, no, you know, you can't be skeptical. You need to stop talking about it and they want to bash you or whatever. I've got both sides and I'm trying to get in the middle and you're helping me do that. So thank you so much. You are very welcome. Thanks for having me. And, uh, you know, hopefully this was a little bit useful. So uh, it's always good to be in the uh, in the middle. So uh, what, what I believe. But anyways, thank you for your time and I appreciate it. And thank you for the $10 million that you gave me to come on your show. <laughs> and never forget, if you're lost, you don't know what you are, you can join us. We are Myth Vision. Ladies and gentlemen, join Myth Vision's Patreon, not only to support us, but there are 72 videos that I did with Dr. Dennis R. McDonald and Richard Carrier, all on the Patreon, early access. You guys can ask personal questions when I go to interview these scholars, and you're helping Myth Vision grow.